everyone, it's Melo. Today we're going to be talking about The Haunting of Hill House by none other than Miss Shirley Jackson herself. Also, let's get this out of the way now. The title, it's clickbait, but there's no shame in the game, okay? If you're new around here, it's a joke that I always have some kind of beverage while I'm filming, usually an energy drink. I encourage you to get your own little bev while watching. Everything is better when you have a bev. If you haven't read this story yet, I highly suggest you do so on your own. Whether that's before or after this video, um, either or. I am going to spoil the ending by all means, but I'm also going to explain to you like the interpretations and the meanings and stuff like that. So it might help you to watch this video before you watch it, just so you know what's going on while you're reading it. Um, but it's up to you, it is completely up to you if you wanna read it before or after, if you wanna read it at all. Just, just so you know, spoilers are ahead. I was actually inspired to read this book because my boyfriend's one of his favorite series of all time, I think, is The Haunting of Hill House on Netflix. And we very much have a dynamic of like, he loves movies and films and stuff like that, and I am incapable of sitting down and watching a movie. So I typically just read the book that it was based off of. So I finally took the time, dedicated a night to read The Haunting of Hill House. And it was not what I was expecting, to say the least. So if you have watched the series and you loved it and you want to read the book where the series came from, just know that you're getting into a completely different story. Both things are amazing for sure. They're just different. <laughs> the only thing that I've found similar so far, I haven't really, I haven't finished the series, so I don't know. But the only thing so far that I've found Similar on the two things is the names of the characters and the Hill House existing. Everything else is pretty much different. I mean, the characters in the series are all related, they're a family, whereas in the book, they're not. <laughs> I just wanted to get that out of the way right away um, because I know that there's probably a decent amount of people who have watched the series first and then wanted to go to the book and I think you should know that it's very good. The book itself is amazing on its own. It's just different. That being said, I'm a book channel. We're gonna talk about books now. <laughs> Hill House starts with one of my favorite written paragraphs probably ever. Um, so I'm gonna read it for you, of course, obviously. No life organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. Hill House, not sane, stood by itself against its hills holding darkness within. It had stood so for 80 years and might stand for 80 more. But then walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there, walked alone. Um, we're gonna revisit some quotes during this. Um, so just remember that quote, just remember that quote. It, co it comes back. It's just an amazing tone for the book. It's very spooky, it is engaging, it leaves you going like, what well, walks there? Oh my god, like what's going on? Is the house alive? Like, what's going on? So definitely, it's definitely spooky. We meet our four main characters. We have Dr. Montague. He is a philosopher, I believe. Um, his goal is to scientifically prove ghosts' existence, or just the supernatural in general. So he rents out Hill House, which is regarded as a super haunted house, and the family who owns it says that they want one of their family members inside of the house and so we meet Luke. Luke will inherit the house one day um, when, you know, people start dying, it becomes Luke's house. He's a petty thief, but he's very lazy. He really only likes to steal cash and stuff like that, which is why they're totally chill with having him in the house because he's not gonna take something and sell it. He just wants the cash. Luke is kind of a shitty guy. We learn right away, kind of sucks. He's not a good guy. He's very well educated, but by all means, he's very selfish and he is very, flirty um, without meaning it. Like, he just has a lot going on. He has a lot going on. <laughs> we then meet Theodora or Theo. She's very independent. I think of like a stereotypical like LA Valley girl um, kind of person when I think about Theo. That's definitely dumbing it down, but she's super free spirited. She's, you know, careless. She's strong hearted, passionate, very warm, extroverted kind of person. She immediately makes friends with everyone. Everyone immediately loves her. But the second that she's hungry, tired, or cold, she becomes super moody and mad and just mean. Um, and many times we're gonna see in this book, time and time again, she's very 
angry, she's very rude, she's very mean, um, she's also not really the best person. Then our last character, our main character at that, Miss Eleanor. Eleanor is a 32 year old woman. She took care of her mom for 11 years. Um, her mom had just died though. So this means she has no friends, she has no real home. She has a sister, but she has a really bad relationship with her sister and her husband. So Eleanor starts out the story already very insecure. She's very fragile minded. Um, she's already not doing very well mentally, socially, anything. She's kind of already at a pretty difficult stand point in her life. I mean, one of her first quotes is her talking about how she's never been happy in her adult life. Like she's never felt happiness. She's consistently living in her mind, daydreaming. All day, every day, she just lives inside of her daydreams about what her life could be. She's dreaming about what, you know, could be in opposed to what her life actually is. Because in her real life, she's no one. She doesn't really have a home. She doesn't have friends. She doesn't have family. So just, yeah, she's not doing very well. And Dr. Montu gathers this group of people. Luke aside, he's there because he's an inheritor of the house. But Theo and Eleanor both had supernatural reports growing up. They had something supernatural happen to them. So that's why they're there. Story begins, everyone starts beginning to make their way to Hill House. We follow the perspective of Eleanor though. So she starts to drive to Hill House. And as I said before, she is just daydreaming. Everything she sees, she's like, wow, I could live in this little cottage and be a little fairy lady. And oh, I could live here and be like this and do this. Everywhere she goes, she's just daydreaming about what her life could be. She is more excited for the journey to get to Hill House rather than just being at Hill House. Like she was looking forward to getting there and like taking the steps to get there more so than getting there. Uh, she arrives at Hill House and I absolutely adored Jackson's writing here. Just gonna read you some stuff. No human eye can isolate the unhappy coincidence of line and place which suggests evil in the face of a house. And yet somehow a maniac juxtaposition, a badly turned angle, some chance meeting of roof and sky turned Hill House into a place of despair. More frightening because the face of Hill House seemed awake with the watchfulness from the blink windows and a touch of glee in the eyebrow of a cornice. Almost any house caught unexpectedly or at an odd angle can turn into a deeply humorous look on a watching person. Even a mischievous little chimney or a dormer like a dimple can catch up a beholder with a sense of fellowship. But a house arrogant and hating, never off guard, can only be evil. Hill House would stay as it was until it was destroyed. So that does a very great job at beginning the horror. Um, I adored the writing. I adored the writing in this. It was just so good. But immediately we're painting the house as being alive. The house is an entity. The house is a character itself. It has no regard for the outside world. The house is its like own secluded place in the world. We also meet Mr. and Mrs. Dudley here. Mr. Dudley, he watches the gate um, and he gives everyone a very hard time getting into Hill House. Him and his wife take care of the Hill House. Mrs. Dudley is like the maid perhaps. Um, but they never stay past dark. Him and his wife both kind of encourage everyone to leave, like to get out, to not stay at Hill House, which is haunting. Uh, inside, Mrs. Dudley takes Eleanor to her room. She gets the blue room, everything in it is blue. This part of the book reminded me heavily of uh, Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> that was a joke that I can somehow bring up Edgar Allan Poe in every single one of my videos. It's not a joke, it's real. Uh, but this reminded me of A Mask of the Red Death, um, every room being its own color and having its own symbolism present. I really loved that in this book. I thought it was done pretty well. Uh, Theo arrives next. Eleanor and Theo instantly become friends. Theo gets the green room. They become so close immediately. They are like, oh my God, like, it's so funny. Like we're so close, like we're like cousins. Like we're, we're like cousins. Uh, they go exploring outside. They get scared of a bunny. Their relationship is very symbolic of a sisterly relationship. They bond because they are complete polar opposites of each other and together they contrast the darkness of Hill House. Anyway, we now meet Dr. Montague and Luke. We learn about some history. First of all, the last person who was in the house was killed because of a horse. 
this is important. Just remember this in regards to the ending. Then we learn about the house. Uh, it was built 80 years ago by a man named Hugh Crane. His wife died right before moving in. He remarried twice, but both women somehow died. He eventually just left the house and sent his two daughters to go live elsewhere. The two daughters fought relentlessly over the house, but the older sister is the one that ended up getting ownership of the house and lived there with her caretaker. She died in the house and then the ownership then went to the caretaker, not the sister, which made obviously the younger sister very furious because she felt like it belonged to her, like that was her childhood home, like this is my home. What's going on here? The younger sister relentlessly harassed the woman, the caretaker, like would just like stand there and stare and it was just a very weird thing. The caretaker ended up not being able to handle it anymore and she hung herself from the tower that is in the house. From there, the caretaker's relatives were the people that got the ownership of the house, hence that's Luke's family. A big part of this book. I'm skipping over a good amount of it because again, this is just a summary and I encourage you to go read this on your own. But a part of this book that I really liked was how large this house was. And they're just trying to figure out and navigate their way throughout the house. The house itself is this like maze. It's so large. And there's a symbolic relationship with the doors opening and closing, which I thought, I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was so well done. It shows the fight between freedom in the house versus being confined in the house. Every door closes immediately behind them. If they open a door, it doesn't like stay open, it immediately slams behind them. Even when they try to prop open all the doors, there's like every single night, they try to prop open all the doors and when they wake up, the doors were all closed. So when the door closes behind them, right? They're in this dark state. They're left to travel to find the next door. They lack knowledge. They don't really know what's going on. They lack knowledge about the house, which is what is shown. Their desire to leave the doors open shows their desire for freedom. They desire knowledge. They want to know about the house. They want to leave everything open. You know, they want to leave the doors open so that they can know what's inside of them, literally and symbolically. But the house doesn't let them. The house closes their paths, it closes their options, um, it confines them to their ignorance. I thought that was a super cool detail. I thought it was a great detail at personifying the house itself. Um, the details with the symbolic relationship too, I thought was beautiful. After learning about the history of the house, we see Eleanor's first mental slip. She thinks she is ready and prepared and she can handle all of this, but it is showing that she cannot. She is absolutely frightened. And Jackson does a very great job at writing Eleanor's almost like manic state of mind. Like she is completely dissociating in this scene. She's having like an out of body dissociation period and she's trying to regulate and ground herself and remind herself like, I'm not frightened, I'm okay. She's pale and then randomly out of nowhere, everyone's just like talking and hanging out. And she says, I have red shoes. And they're all like, Cool. So clearly her mental state is already slipping. Another detail about this book is when we meet Mrs. Dudley, she's like seemingly on a script. She's repeating the same words, the same phrases over and over and over again. This does a very good job of personifying the house and it raises some questions too. Like what's listening to her? Why is she on a script? She's seemingly scared and frightened, um, which is a good personification of the house itself because the house is listening. But I do have some criticisms with this and we'll talk about that at the end. Also, I don't know if you caught on to it when I read you the last quote, but Jackson does a very cool thing here and she establishes that when Hugh Crane built this house, he built all of the angles slightly wrong. So a hallway typically goes like this, right? So you're looking down the hallway and you're looking straight ahead of you. But in the Hill House, it kind of goes like this kind of goes a little bit diagonal. Not enough where it looks completely this way, but just a little bit off. This is used to explain why people go mad in this house. They blame the angles, the paranoia that that creates. Because everything is just slightly off. It's not like in your face off. So people don't realize it, but it's driving their paranoia. This is a theory that we will look into later. I just think it's a great detail and it definitely adds like what the fuck is going on. 
This is a theory that we will look into later, but I just think it is super cool. It is a super cool detail that adds on to the like, what the fuck is going on here nature of this book. They start exploring the house, they get to the tower or the library. Eleanor smells something very bad. She refuses to go into the tower library. It is unclear whether Eleanor made this up because she was just frightened or if the house made it purposely so that only her would smell the smell. It's an important detail. Remember, remember the small details. We then get to the nursery, which is the most haunted part of the house. There's a super, super cold spot right outside of it. There's some creepy stuff going on that they all experience too. We then have our first major character shift um, in this next scene when Theo paints Eleanor's toes red. Eleanor gets very upset. She's acting very childlike in these next chapters. She's very fragile. She's very insecure. She gets her toes painted even though she hates the color red. And instead of being like chill about it, she gets super childlike. She freaks out. She gets super mad. She's very insecure about herself and the way that she interacts with people socially. Um, she regards herself as like, oh, poor me. I am just a little baby. Poor me. But when anyone else regards her in this manner for acting the way that she's acting, she gets very mad. She gets very upset. She hates that she's perceived this way. Eleanor makes fun of Theo for getting like hangry and her mood being dependent on how she's feeling. And she regards Theo as this like child, childlike gal, but she lacks the ability to understand that she does the same thing. Like she is just as childish and insecure and frightened as Theo is. Um, after this happens with the whole toe painting scene, we get our first real spook. Later on in the night, um, Eleanor in the night hears like her mom calling her name. She realizes like, oh shit, that's not my mother. So she goes into Theo's room. Um, their rooms are connected by like a bathroom. And they start hearing this super loud banging on all the doors outside in the hallway. They hear something like banging on all the doors and like walking around in the hallway. And it is coming to their room. It is making their way to their room. The door, it starts shaking violently. They start like slamming on it. Eleanor calls Theo a big baby, even though she is just as, if not more frightened. Dr. Montague and Luke show up once everything is calm and settled. They say that they didn't hear anything because they were too busy chasing a ghost dog outside. So it is clear that the house is trying to separate them. It is also important to note the um, supernatural experiences that happens to the entire group and just Eleanor. So it shows that clearly it is not all psychological. Like clearly there is something haunted going on at this house. It is not completely in Eleanor's mind. <laughs> but already Eleanor is feeling like these events are for me. Like, why do you also hear the banging? This is clearly in my head. Like, why are you also hearing the banging on the wall? Like, that's clearly for me. So these scenes just make it a very blurry picture of what the fuck is going on. <laughs> like, is there a ghost? Is there like a poltergeist? Is there multiple ghosts? Is it just the house itself alive? But like, what does that even mean? Is it Eleanor that's causing all of this? I don't know. I was very confused when I got to this point of the book asking those questions, but we'll get there in a second. Uh, the next morning, they discover the words Eleanor come home were written huge in like chalk on the wall. Eleanor, she's panicked about the house knowing and picking on her. Theo suggests pretty heavily that Eleanor did it herself. Then they all begin picking on Eleanor, kind of like making fun of her, and it's a huge argument. We see Luke's character very present in this point because he's really just instigating everything and being a complete asshole. Later on, Theo discovers that all of her clothes were torn off from the hanger and ruined. And on her wall were the words, help, Eleanor, come home, Eleanor. Um, and it was written on the wall with it, what it looked like blood. Eleanor is literally unfazed. In this moment, she's just like, oh, Ella. Okay, it's literally red nail polish, but. Uh, Theo then moves into Eleanor's room. They sleep in the same room together. She also uses Eleanor's clothing, which Eleanor secretly hates. And she's very, 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 very much um, resenting Theo starting now. Eleanor says that she kind of wants to just surrender to the house and everyone starts getting frightened because they're like, oh, don't say that. Oh no, that's not good. 
<laughs> so immediately they're being like, why, what, what are you talking about? Like, no, you, we can't, we can't be doing that. Remember, like we have to be sane. And um, so they immediately are kind of worried about her and she gets super insecure about how they're perceiving her. That night, Eleanor is woken up to a supernatural event it sounds like a child is being like tortured outside of her uh, room. And if you remember, they're sleeping, um, Eleanor and Theo, they're sleeping in the same room now. And so she reaches over to like the bed to kind of grab Eleanor's, or to grab Theo's arm, I'm sorry. And she's like holding on and she feels Theo holding back and she's like, okay, we got each other. Suddenly it's over, the lights are back on. Theo is on the complete other side of the room not holding Eleanor's hand <laughs> and Eleanor says whose hand was I holding and that that scene was really gross but it definitely adds more confusion of like what's going on in this house <laughs> is that a cliche ass horror scene absolutely it's gonna get me every time though this part has huge foreshadowing and the huge theme is prevalent that being the supernatural versus the psychological effects Dr. Montague here says that ghosts cannot hurt people. Only people can hurt people. Keep that in mind. Huge, huge foreshadowing. Because the house starts taunting and picking on Eleanor because she is the weakest link. It never touches her. It never harms her. It never directly causes pain on her, but it gets her to slowly start resenting the group and take matters into her own hands. When she sees her name written on the wall, she gets super angry. She gets super mad at everyone and she starts blaming everyone else. She then starts acting and feeling violently towards Theo um, and like hating her even though prior we learned that they were so close that they were like saying that they were cousins. She is deteriorating very fast. The whole thing with the crying kid too is also very interesting. It shows perhaps the more psychological aspects of the way that the house is taunting her because we know already that Eleanor did not have the most typical, very happy childhood. And so the crying kid was most likely symbolic of Eleanor herself. The kid is her crying and asking for help and love. And that's why Eleanor acts so passionately and like strongly in that scene because she wants to help baby her. Uh, there's a super interesting scene with Eleanor and Luke. It shows just how insecure and paranoid Eleanor is about other people perceiving her. She talks to Luke and the whole time she's just hyper focused on everything. <laughs> she's like, oh, I'm saying this. So he's thinking this. And then because he's thinking this, I'm gonna say this. But what if he thinks this? And what if he's only saying that because I said this, so I'm gonna say this instead because he's only thinking this. He's probably actually thinking this. Like instead of just having the conversation, the entire time she's fully in her head thinking thoughts like that. And then what she is thinking directly like is the opposite of what she says out loud to Luke. She's thinking like mean thoughts in her brain, but then like nice kind words come out of her mouth, which shows just how weak and insecure her state of mind is. Um, then later, Eleanor and Theo, they go outside because Theo kind of humiliated Eleanor in front of everyone. They begin walking on this black pathway surrounded by all of these white trees. Theo is like holding on to Eleanor. They're very afraid of like what's going on. They witness a picnic. Theo says something about like, just keep running forward. Don't look behind, just keep going forward. They run inside to Luke and Dr. Montague. They are unable to speak. They're so petrified of like what just happened. Um, but the only thing that Eleanor can say is something about a picnic. This scene is, you guessed it, more symbolism. And it ties in to the conversation that Luke and Eleanor were just having. And that is longing for a home and familial relationships. Theo was completely isolated as a kid. We already know about Eleanor's unhappy past. Luke reveals that his mom was not in his life. Montague acts fatherly towards the three um, due to a lack of his own children. These feelings manifest in different gothical symbolism ways, the paths and the trees showing isolation and like being alone. The picnic is symbolic of a happy family. It is something that they all don't have, but they all long for. And just as soon as it appears, it is taken away and overtaken by the darkness and that feeling is lost. I have mixed feelings about this scene. We'll talk about it later, but it's just more symbolic than it is spooky. 
reading it, you're kind of confused. You're catching on to the symbolism, but it's not spooky. Uh, we meet our last two characters, and oh god, they suck. <laughs> uh, Dr. Montague's wife shows up, and her little friend Arthur. I'll spare you the details, but they gave me Lady Catherine de Berg and Mr. Collins. Like, that was the vibe that these characters gave me from Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> so she gets to work immediately. She starts using a uh, planchette to start talking to all the ghosts and ghouls. The ghosties, they were talking a lot about Nell, Nellie, home, mother, obviously referring to Eleanor. So again, the house, the spirits are picking on Eleanor. The group is mildly uncomfortable by this, but then they go to sleep. Uh, Mrs. Montague wants to sleep in the creepy haunted nursery. She also reinforces the thought process about how ghosts can't hurt you. The rest of the characters all go to bed, but then they end up meeting in Dr. Montague's room. Uh, so they all gather in Dr. Montague's room, the original four, because they all just felt like something bad was gonna happen. So they start hearing the banging on the walls again like they did the other night until it starts to get to their door. Eleanor, she is super cold, she's so overwhelmed, she's so frightened, and she's just completely lost in her senses. She can sense everything going on in the house before she just blacks out. Before blacking out though, she even acknowledges um, her lack of awareness about whether the things going on are in her head or actually happening. She wakes up, Luke is by the window, he's got a bruised face, um, but Arthur and Mrs. Montague, they wake up on the other side of the hall, like completely fine, they had a good rest, they wake up going like yawning, being like, oh you guys are so tired, we slept so good. <laughs> So the characters did experience this together. It's not psychological in that regard, but it's not to say that the reason they experienced it was because of Eleanor. Because Mrs. Montague and Arthur, who were super far away from Eleanor, were completely fine. But the characters who were near Eleanor as she was having this like overwhelming sense of like a breakdown experienced some supernatural happenings. So it's possible that her own psychological warfare going on with this house picking on her is starting to manifest in real life events. And because she blacks out, she's completely unaware of her involvement. She has absolutely no memory of what happened. She might have known, she might have been aware, she might have been controlling things, but we'll never know. Um, Eleanor then starts insisting that after all of this happens, she's gonna go live off with Theo, even though Theo's being like, <laughs> No, no girl, no, uh, you're gonna go back to your life. This is just a little vacation. And Eleanor is like insisting, being like, I don't care if you approve of it. I'm going to move to where you live. I'm going to live with you. I'm gonna be with you. And it's just super weird and creepy. It's definitely a mix of showing Theo's character coming to light, but also Eleanor's. Because Theo is being pretty unnecessarily mean to Eleanor, being like, do you ever go anywhere that you're wanted? And Eleanor, in response to that, says, I've never been wanted anywhere. Um, so it's very creepy, but it's really sad. Eleanor is so lonely. She is longing for someone to love her and want her. And even though these characters said that they're like cousins, it is showing in Theo's character that she is not okay with taking on a real familial relationship with Eleanor. She can't and she won't be that role for Eleanor no matter how much Eleanor pushes it and like tries for it. And Eleanor pushing it so much shows her lack of awareness of what a real familial relationship even is or how you create one. It is sad because she clearly doesn't understand how people make friends and like are connected with their family. She thinks kind of like, oh, you just pick someone and then you're good. Like she doesn't understand the like what goes into making that relationship and that's really sad too. We also start seeing that Eleanor is completely chill. She's good. She loves Hill House. She doesn't really plan on leaving Hill House. Even when she was making her journey, she never really was planning to leave. She loves it there. The next scene was rather confusing when I read it for the first time, so I'm gonna do my best to explain. Luke, Theo, and Eleanor all begin walking to the brick outside. And Eleanor admits that she feels guilty for her mom's death because she didn't wake up when her mom was calling her for her medicine that morning. And Theo basically calls her an attention seeker, being like, oh yeah, I think you just like to feel that way so that you can like get like sympathy and like 
I think you just like to feel that way. So Eleanor taking this gets just completely lost in thought and just begins walking and she realizes she is all alone. She hears someone calling her name, but she's turning around, she's looking around, there's no one there. Then she finally finds Luke and Theo and to her face they belittle her and they're super rude. They're just like, oh well we decided we wanted to be over here and like yeah we called it but you didn't come so we left. She then starts sneaking around all of the rooms to listen to people without them knowing. And the one thing in common about all of these conversations is that Eleanor is never mentioned. They never talk about her. Down to the fact that Arthur asks Dr. Montague where everyone is and Montague goes, oh yeah, I think uh, Luke and Theo are over there. Her intent of sneaking around and listening to everyone was to overhear and listen how people thought about her and how they perceived her because you know she's very insecure about that but she hasn't even left enough of an impression on these people to talk about her or perceive her regardless like she does not exist to these people until she is in front of them she's left no impression when all she wants was to be seen and loved and heard she's left no impression later that night eleanor hears a child singing, someone's brushing her face, and she's happy. This is different to all the other scary, spooky events where she was freaked out. She is happy. She's happy because she's experiencing this on her own. This is her own experience. She doesn't share it with anyone else in the house. Only she knows and only she can sense what is going on in the hill house. And that brings her some sort of like safety. Like this is her home. This is her place. Her spirits, this belongs to her. She feels identity in this house and that's the first time she's really felt that anywhere. And this, my friends, is where the story starts wrapping up. So let's, let's do it. Eleanor, in the middle of the night, she wakes up and she feels a strong sense to go to the library. She says it's because she needs a book, but she knows that she's involuntarily being forced to go into the library. She then hears her mother calling her from upstairs. She begins frantically running through the hallway banging on all the doors. And that scene was so chilling to me. It was so haunting. The thought of her banging on the doors and doing all the things that the ghosts were doing. Like I, I have this specific picture in my head of her doing it. And anytime I think about it, chills. <laughs> Regardless, uh, Mrs. Montague wakes up in the middle of the night hearing it. And she thinks Eleanor is a ghost. If you remember, Mrs. Montague is in the room, the nursery that had the cold spot in the front. And Eleanor comments about how that's gone. She doesn't feel a cold spot anymore. In fact, the entire house feels warm. So Eleanor is getting panicked. She's realizing that everyone's waking up. So she rushes into the library, climbs to the top of the dangerous staircase, tries to get out of the trap door where the caretaker from before killed herself, but she can't, it's locked. Luke goes up to save her. They get her down safely. Eleanor this whole time, is regarding herself as a completely different entity than what is sleeping in her room. The staircase is a very obvious, very clear symbolism of rebirth. As she climbs it, she's becoming rebirth. She's becoming one with the house. She tries to kill herself in that moment to finalize the step, but instead she's brought down. Her rebirth is paused and she gains consciousness again. And she starts regarding herself as Eleanor again, and she feels guilty, she feels insecure, she feels shameful. And Luke, to her face, is being like, God, you're so lucky that I saved you. You are selfish, you are crazy, you are insane. Like, just belittling her to her face. And Eleanor is fully feeling the weight of all of those words. So the next morning, Dr. Montague very clearly cares for Eleanor, and he's like, you're going insane, you need to get the fuck out of here. He tells her that she is unwell and that she needs to go home and forget about the house. There's a scene right before Eleanor leaves where Theo comes rushing out of the house and is like hugging and like crying, kissing Eleanor, being like, oh my God, I thought you weren't gonna say bye to me. Like, I love you. Oh my gosh, write to me, I miss you already. Um, like crying and it shows the complexity of the relationship and just uh, the sisterly relationship, which I really enjoyed. So Eleanor begins leaving and as she's driving, she gets a little thought in her brain. She turns the car around and speeds into a tree, killing herself. And for a brief moment before she dies, she's like, why am I even doing this? Why is no one stopping me? Which is really sad. 
it's more that the house is making her do it. Like even she doesn't fully understand why she's doing it. The house has like fully possessed her to do this. Killing herself makes it so that she is forever one with this house. She now lives with the history, the supernatural residence for now until forever. And I wanna read you the last quote because yeah! the writing is so good. Hill House itself, not sane, stood against its hills holding darkness within. It had stood so for 80 years and might stand for 80 more. Within its walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silently, steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there walked alone. So the story begins and ends the same way because nothing fucking matters. <laughs> when I read that, chills, chills. I love that kind of writing. Uh, the story ends, we learn that everyone goes about with their own life. Um, as I mentioned, Dr. Montague wrote an article. He wrote his little thing about the Hill House and it was, it, it did really poorly. Um, anyways, have any questions? Because I surely did. <laughs> surely, that's funny. The thing I've come to terms with is the fact that you are supposed to have questions and thoughts about this book. It is not so much a horror tale, but rather a symbolic mean to tell a story, to tell a meaning. Like it's, of course it's spooky, but it's just not typical spooky. The spookiness is not ghosts and the supernatural. The spookiness is the torture and the torment that is the human brain. This is a story about Eleanor being so weak and insecure that this haunted house tears her apart for it. It was a good story for what it's worth, but I definitely had my critiques and um, I kind of understand why Netflix probably changed the story so much. I don't think that this would have worked very well in film, so I definitely understand why they changed the story and why they changed everything. That being said, I absolutely loved the writing in this book. It never felt overly confusing. It is so refreshing to read something classical and not be overly confused. Um, it was just, it was very clear. Um, there's only a few scenes towards the end that kind of confused me, but again, it wasn't overly confusing. The writing itself was just beautiful. Jackson is able to characterize specifically Eleanor so well and for being under 200 pages we see this immense change in her character that was really cool, it was really effective. Like the manic writing, the difference in her like violent hatred thoughts versus like the nice kind thing she tells people, the insecure overthinking and analyzing and disassociation, I thought it was just done so well. The spooky scenes very few, but they were spooky. Her writing was just absolutely beautiful in regards to the gothic imagery and symbolism, like the white trees and the black path, like that scene was beautiful. The ending gives me chills, like the last paragraph itself gives me chills, like the way that the house stands unchanged after everything that happened, the house is the same. Which is amazing. This book is so worth it for the writing itself. I also love the characters because of how much I hated them. <laughs> like I think the personification of every character, including the house, was just so perfect. Like I hated Luke and quite a bit at that, but like I wasn't really supposed to like him. <laughs> that was the intent of this book. Shirley Jackson wrote it in a way that as a reader, I'm gonna go insane as Eleanor is also losing her mind. I follow her thoughts. She says I hate this character and then she gives me and she shows me a reason for me to hate the character. And that's because the reader is supposed to fall mad and fall into the trap of the house at the same time. As much as I hated Mrs. Montague and she was literally Lady Catherine de Bourgh all over again, I, I loved her. As much as I hated her, I loved her. She comes into the story and she absolutely fucks everything up. Because she comes and she does very non-scientific not real research. She comes in, she does her cliche horror shit. While she's talking about like the planchette thing that she did, she's like, I'm sensing a nun here and there's a monk and there's something hidden in the cellar that we need to see. Or just those like very cliche like horror things, you know? But at the same time, she does all of that. But then she also taps into the Eleanor come home, Nell, Melly home, mother. Like she taps into all of that. So it shows that like she might have some psychic ability, but then what is what is going on with the nun and the monk? Or is it Eleanor tampering with her thoughts unknowingly? Maybe it's just Eleanor possessing her mind unknowingly 
and she doesn't actually have any real psychic ability. There's just so many interpretations with every little thing in this story that I don't even know really where to begin. That being said, while we're on the topic, I had so many questions. <laughs> when I read this, I had so many questions that I wish got answered. Uh, why wasn't the history of Ukraine talked about more? Why wasn't it more important? The cellar? That is weird. They talk about the cellar and how it's completely off limits at the beginning of the story. What's going on there? Is there anything in the cellar? Was Mrs. Montague making that part up? Or maybe she does have psychic ability and she is able to tap into something. Maybe there really is something going on there. Why is Mrs. Dudley talking on the script? What's their history? Why were the Dudleys more important? Is Eleanor controlling the supernatural events? If so, why were there even ghosts in this story? Um, at the beginning, the first spooky event, Miss uh, Dr. Montague and Luke are chasing off a ghost dog. They see a ghost, but there was no there was no dog. They never there was no real dog. So is that the only ghost in the story? Were there any ghosts? Was that just like What's going on? <laughs> is the house itself just alive? Is that the only supernatural event going on with the house? But the thing is, none of that is important. I just wish it was. <laughs> that is the reason that I say that this book is a horrific means to tell a theme rather than a horror story with themes in it. Because there's so much potential. The Dudleys have so much spooky potential. Ukraine, the sisters, we never even find out really anything about the ghosts. Like there's so much spooky stuff that is disregarded because it's not important. So yeah, I absolutely loved this story. There's a few different interpretations with what the fuck is going on with Eleanor. The one that I talk about this whole time, it's very clearly my favorite one. And it's that the house itself was alive and possessed almost Eleanor because she was the weakest minded person. That's my favorite interpretation. That is the way that I will continue to see the story. Um, but there's definitely some other ways that people see it. Some people think that Eleanor has some like telekinesis ability from the very start of the story and that she goes to Hill House and she's controlling everything. Every supernatural event that happens is because Eleanor made it happen rather than the house making it happen so that it drives Eleanor insane, is that Eleanor herself was actually doing it and controlling it. Those are the two main interpretations and theories I have seen with Eleanor. Um, as I said, I don't really like the whole telekinesis, it was her all along kind of thing, because I think that kind of makes the story irrelevant then. This is a horrific story to tell a theme rather than a horror story with themes in it. And if you use the whole she has telekinesis abilities and she was controlling it the whole time, I think it kind of makes the whole theme of like Eleanor being weak-minded and stuff like that and the house picking on her for it. I think it kind of makes that irrelevant then if it was truly her the whole time, but I digress. Anyways, this is a really short book. It is just under 200 pages. I got done with it in two nights. Um, it's really short. I really suggest that you read this on your own if you haven't already. It's an amazing story. I loved it so much. Um, after a few days of sitting on it, I did put this on my favorite books of all time list. Um, I rated it only a four out of five, but I get chills. Anytime I think about the story and anything, the writing, I just get chills and I love it so much. I just, yeah! so yeah, definitely a good read. We're getting close to October, um, so I suggest so just picking this one up. If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, maybe come back next weekend. I post videos every weekend on a variety of different book related topics. So if any of that interests you, consider staying around. I hope your beverage was very good. I forgot about mine, so. Oops, I had a pretty rough time filming this video. I'm not gonna lie. So if it came across messy and if I was like distant, at all. Sorry about it. Anyways, um, I have a good deal of other videos on my channel if you want to see more of my face, um, but if none of those suit you, I'll be back next weekend with an absolute banger. Banger. Bang. <laughs> Alright guys, have a good rest of your day. Have a good week, month, life maybe. Um, have a great spooky season. I'll be back with more spooky videos next weekend, but until then,